All right, I'm going to be talking about paradigm shifts. You know what a paradigm is? I think so. I mean, that's, uh, you know, a, a philosophy, a way of thinking, uh, you know, there are a number of synonyms. Yeah, it's basically the fundamental beliefs of what is real. Uh, it turns out that we have the scientific paradigm, and, and people have their own personal paradigm. In fact, we all do. It is what you really believe is real. It's the, your fundamental core beliefs. And if you're a scientist, you'll, you'll believe in uh, the laws of physics, the laws of science. Well, let's say a new claim comes along. You're a good scientist in academia, a free energy device or cold fusion. Impossible, you, uh, you say. It violates the laws of physics. It must be a fraud or a mistake. An example in history was the discovery of the airplane. That was the attitude of the scientific community. It was absolutely impossible for a heavier air vehicle to fly. And of course, recently we saw cold fusion examples. Another example is Bacris, uh, Professor Bacris at Texas A&M. He claimed to have measured transmutation. They tried to throw him out of the university. They couldn't because he had tenure and he had a great experiment that proved that proved that he had it. He could not. They did not throw him out until he until he left. There's many examples. It's because there's what's called the standard proof uh, that goes, this is an academic person, or actually all of us. It is impossible, therefore it's fraud. And impossible means according to the laws of physics of my paradigm. That's a very important phrase to add because guess what? The, law, the fundamental laws of physics change over time. And Thomas Kuhn wrote the book, uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And he shows this occurring in history, and it's occurring right now. And basically, a paradigm violation is when the experiment violates the accepted laws of, of science. That community that believed in that paradigm throw out the scientific method, and instead, the scientists act like people. They act like human beings. The new claim is ignored, ridiculed, and rejected. They will never change their minds. They simply die out, and the next generation takes over. Uh, this is, becomes very relevant when you want to c declare something a fraud. You see a, a, an experimental claim, uh, but there could be many facets of the frauds, and you'll see that how these facets can change as you recognize your own personal paradigm of what you truly believe is the laws of physics. Somebody could be running an potential scam. I call that a type one fraud. Uh, could simply be a mistaken measurement. Uh, I call that type two fraud. Or there could truly be an energetic anomaly that was measured, but the person has poor business practices, which is very typical on, on some esoteric inventor because he doesn't have enough funds to do the invention. And there could be a wrong explanation. Well, of course, there's going to be a wrong explanation because when we have this energy anomaly, nobody's going to really understand where it's coming from. So these are, these are the facets. So it's important when you want to call somebody a fraud to qualify what type of fraud do you mean? And the paradigms have changed over, over time. Classical physics is where we begin. I call this the golden age. Uh, just in the standard Newton's laws and Maxwell's equations, classical physics is, the, is really the paradigm that most engineers deal with. And that's what they believe in their hearts. And most inventors are, are the same way. Uh, along came relativity, then quantum mechanics, and quantum mechanics, the zero-point energy came in into science. And now the, qu the, the paradigms are shifting right now. There's quantum gravity versus string brain theory as they try to combine it with quantum mechanics. And they're actually in, in the midst of a paradigm war right now. And what's starting to emerge from that paradigm war and that paradigm shift is the true existence of a fourth dimension of space. And as we explore that, We'll find out. Oh, Lord, paradigms. I was just getting used to 10 dimensions, Maury. <laughs> well, this, we'll get into that. <laughs> and further up on the paradigm list is new paradigms of what is consciousness. And notice that, that someone at the earlier paradigm that believes in this starts to view somebody who believes in another paradigm as a kook. So the, so the person that's on these more... Uh, current paradigms or advanced paradigms are viewed as kooks by somebody on the other paradigm. Most engineers are right here. We have very little in the way of technology that's exploiting things like relativity. In quantum mechanics, we have solid state stuff and things like that. But uh, as far as getting the involved in the zero point energy, uh-uh. It's typically not believed. And, and what we'll find out is this is very different 
then where the physicists are out, advanced physicists that are discussing the, the advanced theories and, and quantum gravity and string brain theory, they are off on a totally different paradigm that they truly, truly believe. And they look like absolute kooks to people in, in the engineering community, in the engineering paradigm. So basically, classical physics was considered the golden age. We had a fixed background of space and time. There were differential equations, the, the dif the derivatives in space and time. All systems evolve like a perfect machine. There's one fixed future, and then basically the ether supported the propagation of light. Uh, Maxwell's ether was a fluid theory of fluid dynamics. That's how they thought of it back then in the 1800s. Uh, the Michelson and Morley theory, uh, experiment came along and the physics community ruled it out. Said, look, the ether th doesn't exist. That's, uh, but they were trying to measure static ether. Not so fast. Dayton Miller, the president of the American Physical Society, continued the experiments, working with Michelson to build an interferometer 10 times more sensitive. And when he ran this interferometer at sea level, he pretty well got the same results as Michelson and Morley. But when he took it up to Mount Wilson, he found out there's evidence for an ether theory where the ether is dragged along by the Earth. The, and, and when it's down at sea level, it looks like it's, it's completely static. There is no ether. But as he went uh, up in Mount Wilson, and he was in sense of nemesis of Einstein because this guy was no kook. This guy, he was the, literally the president of the American Physical Society, and he was an experimentalist. And they could not refute his experiments at all. What happened was uh, people just started to ignore him when relativity became ex uh, accepted. And after he died out, that was it. So excellent uh, paper on this by James DeMeo. So relativity, space-time becomes flexible, rubbery. The pace of time changes, space distorts, and it's all for the purpose of keeping the local speed of light constant in a, that region of space. Uh, cosmology ideas came about. You know, the universe expands, and when we talk, uh, when we say there's contraction, we have things like black holes and things like that that squeeze space in. Then later, in 1930, quantum mechanics came in. Now particles, atoms don't exist. They're kind of these fuzzy wave function things. And later, uh, they started to recognize non-local connections and entanglement. Now, Einstein did not like this a bit. The famous paper in 1935, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, they showed, look, this, this quantum theory is crazy. It implies that distant things are instantaneously connected somehow. Obviously, that can't be. That violates causality and the speed of light and everything else. And the 70s Bell uh, formulated a theorem that allowed people to do experiments, how to do the measurements quantitatively. And sure enough, in the 80s, they started doing those experiments. And, to, and Einstein would be rolling in his grave because it showed that indeed there's this type of non-local connection and some type of entanglement is occurring, and now they're mo starting to model it. They're saying uh, in, in the advanced physics. This, this, is, this is actually a mind blower, and the engineers will have none of it. Uh, it's, just so, it's just so crazy. And also, this is where the zero-point fluctuations and the energy enter into our physics. And there are paradigm choices for the zero-point energy. Uh, some say, oh, it doesn't really exist. It's just a virtual theoretical thing. Other views are it propagates throughout space kind of like heat, but then it would fulfill the, the heat equations. It's not quite that because they see it really is localized. It exists and only in three space. It's just fluctuations in three-dimensional space that arise from nowhere. When you say that, you're violating conservation of energy immediately. Energy just popping in? Well, that's what the Heisenberg uncertainty principle implies in the mathematics. Or you can choose to interpret it that it enters from an actual physically real higher dimensional space. And this is where the paradigm of the zero point energy is leading us to as we apply the more advanced physics to what is going on uh, with the zero point energy. <clears throat> there are interpretations of quantum mechanics. The, originally, the Copenhagen interpretation says just apply the rules. There is just no physical model. Just don't try to think of it, it makes your head spin. Just give up. The transactional interpretation says the wave function interacts with an advanced wave from the future and interacts with now, and that, that's what causes uh, the current reality of the, of the wave function and how the probabilities are predicted. Well, that uh, interpretation that implies there is one single future 
right? It is an attempt to keep just a simple Laplacian machine going, the machine of, okay, there's one future, it's a perfect quantum mechanical machine calculation, it goes out to that one future, it's already predetermined, it, it spins back, and that we're still in that old golden age model of a pure computational machine. The many worlds interpretation says, oh, it's a beating of all these wave functions beating from these truly real parallel universes. And I say most of the physics community don't, don't like that interpretation because what they can't stand is the many me's. Yeah, there's uh, the many, many egos of yourself that impl is implied by that interpretation. Oh my gosh, what a merge conflict. So that's really, really rejected, but it's consistent with the equations of quantum mechanics and probably the biggest proponent uh, writing a layman's book about accepting that and, and promoting that is, is David Deutsch. He's a, he's a physicist. And these are all big name physicists in these books. So as we attempt to unify gravitational theory with quantum mechanics, uh, we get into quantum gravity. This is a layman's book uh, sh uh, sh uh, describing it uh, to layman's terms. These are the physicists truly trying to describe back to the layman's what, what they are doing and what yeah, they're thinking. Yeah, if I remember correctly, one of the, one of the conundrums they run into with, uh, uh, with <coughs> quantum theory is um, uh, the uh, the action how gravity reacts at at the uh, at the quantum level? You know they've pretty much got their their formulas and equations as to how it reacts in the macro universe, and, and you know we you know that, that goes back you know to Newton. But when you get down to the to the quantum level, uh, they've got to incorporate gravity into it somewhere, and that has been a kind of an ongoing problem for it, has it not? And that's what quantum gravity is all about. It's an attempt to roll the quantum physics and combine it with gravity, and it's the vacuum fluctuations, the zero-point energy is throwing a monkey wrench into the works. And basically, they got such ideas that space can expand. They call it an inflation field, and that's how they get that's how they get the expansion. It's like a chunk of space can actually exceed the speed of light, but light within that chunk still propagates at the speed of light. It's like an ether theory, isn't it? Uh, it's way too difficult to do the calculations. They're dealing with infinities all over the place. They use point particle approximation, which people know oh, it can't be that. Uh, and then the zero point fluctuations are throwing infinities into the works. It's very difficult to do calculations. Uh, here's a model of a physically real vacuum fluctuation. It just pops in. It's, it's down at the Planck length, 20 orders of magnitude smaller than the elementary particle. And you see, this is like how it, how it changes over time, and this is its size. It's, so this is a description. The, the vacuum fluctuations are very, very real in this quantum gravity theory. And so it's popping in and leaving, popping in and leaving. And if you don't start to model where does it come from, you naturally have a philosophical violation of conservation of energy. So string theory and brain theory are starting to win this paradigm war. The modeling uh, at the Planck length, they're going to use strings instead of point particles. But the fluctuations, the vacuum fluctuations themselves are, are interacting with the strings. And they can make the strings large, in fact, extremely large during the fluctuating process. And this blew my mind. I had no idea. Well, str strings could all of a sudden fluctuate to a huge thing and still be a single quantum mechanical entity, a single particle, and then at the next quantum instant be, be smaller or be in a different f form. And in order to make the theory work, they had to invoke higher dimensions. And at first they said, oh, the dimensions are curled up because, because w w we can't see them, so they must be curled up. But then they said, no, they can be large scale and, 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 and because our, maybe our wiring, our minds can't see them, but they could really be there. And so what they have is called parallel brains, parallel three-dimensional spaces, and in a higher dimension they call it the bulk. So you have parallel brains in, in the bulk. And the real criticism of string theory is that it's, it's way too flexible. You can model any type of universe, but they just love the computational machine, machinery of string theory. So you see the, the quantum gravity people fighting a paradigm war with the, with the string theory people, and they call each other names and everything else. It's really, it's really like they, they act like the way they treat each other, like monkeys throwing crap at each other. I can't believe it that they mistreat each other so badly. Um, 
And because it they be really out there th- bitch slapping each other. Yeah, it, it threatens their <laughs> paradigm. It's it's this thing of if if you're right, then I'm wrong, and I can't be wrong, right? I I I got to know it all, and it's like this desire uh, to say I got to always be right, and and that's the source of the emotion uh, behind behind this because paradigm changes. A personal paradigm changes an emotional event, and if you feel you're wrong, you commit yourself to this computational machinery and learning all this math and every one of them up at this level are geniuses and and yet they have to fight with each other because of this need to be right as opposed to learning from each other's point of view right that so that's where we are on that paradigm war and lisa randall wrote a great book she's a harvard professor of physics totally secure in her, in her position and she's willing to air some of the issues, the, some of the laundry and the problems that are going on in, in theoretics and, 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 and talk about the problems. That's why I really appreciated this particular book. Uh, it was the only book I found that was really dwelling on the problems. Uh, the Black Hole War. Uh, this is Leonard Susskind. I was going to think, what is this thing? There's, a, there's actually a paradigm crisis right now, it just came out last year uh, in, in physics, it has to do with information of something, of uh, um, losing information in quantum mechanics. And the problem is, if you don't track all the information, the underlying machinery of the quantum mechanical calculation uh, falls apart. It means that's not the bottom line of what's going on in physics. And, and Leonard Susskind explained the crisis the best in this particular book. And the theory, the real crisis came out last year. And this crisis has to do with, um, it's really Stephen Hawking started it way back in 1977, I believe it was. He, it's the vacuum energy itself, the vacuum fluctuations interacting with the event horizon on a black hole. Right? And it makes, a, what it happens there is you make a pair of particles, one pair falls in the event horizon, gets stuck in the black hole, the other pair comes out, and he called that uh, the Hawking radiation. And the issue was, and what the informational loss that recurs, hey, if that thing goes in the black hole, hey, we lost the information. Like, so what? That's what Hawking's attitude was. After all, it's a black hole. Well, of course you're going to lose the information if something falls in. But Susskind said, no, 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 no. This is the, what you do if that happens. You destroy the quantum mechanical uh, calculation that's going on. And he explained what it was. The quantum mechanical wave function propagates like a perf- perfectly in this quasi-linear space-time. In other words, they have to kind of flatten out so they can take their derivatives and everything else. And they have what's called the S-matrix. It says every particle in the system interacts with another particle in the system, uh, and it's described in this, in this big, big matrix where every element represents a pairwise interaction. And that you, And in order to make quantum mechanics perfect, and that it's a perfect calculation of things where, where there is no more physics needed than this, that uh, we have to have every particle uh, that's interacting come into the system and participate in this S matrix, no matter how m- much it is, including uh, vacuum fluctuations if they're going to affect it. This is the foundation of quantum mechanical calculations. And if, the, and if information is lost in a fundamental way, then we philosophically blow this machinery out, this calculation machinery, and say, it, there's something more going on. But no, no, there can't be anything more going on. Quantum mechanics is perfect. And that means we know everything because this calculation is perfect. And if you say something else is going on, uh, we might have to start the theory all over again. And this is the primary objection to allowing the vacuum fluctuations to come in. Every individual fluctuation would have to enter an S matrix. Well, then it would be absolutely impossible to calculate. They're so small, you'd have, you, you have, you know, uh, 10 to the 30th or more uh, things that have to be part of it. So what they do is they remove the vacuum fluctuations by renormalization. And it's, uh, it's a way to zero out the high order terms of, of what's participating. And by renormalization, they can actually get the terms that they want and then get rid of the rest. And a lot of the reasons that they have these dimensions in string theory, a 10-dimensional one or a 26-dimensional one, things like that, it's to get a constant 
that would take away these high order terms these, that would be infinities and remove them. These are the vacuum fluctuation terms, remove them and just let those terms spill in that we want to make the model work. And of course, you kind of get it into this anything goes type of thing. Uh, so if we have interactions of a higher physical dimension is not modeled in, a, in the S matrix. Therefore, we can't have interactions from outside. If we did, we'd have to start physics over. This is the primary objection why we can't allow the vacuum fluctuation energy to enter the system. And it would cause a, basically a paradigm shift. Um, Brian Green is showing how the, all these extra dimensions are existing and what we're trying to do is block what's called orthogonal activity, yet they allow it. If it's from within our dimension, we can start to allow it to explain entanglement. So this leads to the existence of a higher dimension of space, a fourth dimension of space. And that's all you really need to get onto the next level of modeling because one fourth dimension of physical space embeds, embeds an infinite number of three space brains, an infinite number of our three dimensional spaces. So it allows a modeling of entanglement entanglement with wormhole channels that are up in the higher dimension that come back down into our brain. It allows modeling of the zero-point energy by an orthogonal flux. But if you let that spill into your theory, uh, it, it, it's, you'd have to start to redo the calculational machinery that they object to. But if it does spill in, we now open up new propulsion possibilities like warp drive, possibly even time travel, but you can resolve the time paradox by having parallel universes. Are, so are, you're are, we gonna, are we going to get in trouble with somebody living in another brain because we start tapping into zero-point energy and it turns out that we're tapping into energy flowing into our space from theirs and they get pissed off because we're stealing their energy kind of like you know we steal everybody's oil? Yeah, so, uh, there are science fiction stories based on that where they show up later and present a bill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it actually, it, it's, it's uh, the way the zero point energy is propagating is through all the brains. Uh, and so everybody gets plenty. Uh, there's your, there's your, uh, we get these space drives. There's where you're going to get your flying car from that. And you might be a saucer, you don't need any wheels. And so to understand higher dimensions, there's a, uh, Abbott wrote a book back in 1884 called Flatland. It's really cute. I, I, I read it in junior high school, and I really loved it because it explains how higher dimensions can exist. They have all these creatures that are stuck on Flatland in a plane and how they can't understand the third dimension, and it it's really, it's really brings it to life. And a recent book that I really was impressed with was uh, John Violette because he's trying to now apply these ideas uh, to explain uh, uh, consciousness and the nature of 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 time and how that interacts. And he cites Ospensky, a Russian philosopher, uh, Tertium Organum, uh, which basically says that time itself is just our consciousness uh, only perceiving a higher dimension, a slice by slice. We are, we're not wired to perceive the higher dimension all at once. So we can, we're wired to receive the three dimensions of space, but the next dimension up we can only view one slice at a time. So time is really uh, consciousness slicing things up to, to, uh, to absorb it. And no matter, if we were a creature of higher dimensional capability, it would always be one dimensional higher we would have to perceive as a slice at a time, and that would be time for that consciousness. And so um, there presents a new paradigm of time. Julian Barber is a brilliant physicist and philosopher, and he, and he uh, basically works on a farm uh, out in England, I think, outside of Oxford um, in, in the countryside, and physicists make pilgrimages just to visit this guy. He wrote this book, a layman's book, so the physicists could get a bird's eye view of what's going on in the calculation of uh, of all of the physics, whether you're in classical physics, relativity, or quantum mechanics, he says, this is, this is how things propagate over time. And basically, he was saying the same type of model. Imagine it's all embedded in this higher dimensional space. And our, the notion of time is, is our perception slicing it one, one at a time. It's a very similar idea. I really love this book. Uh, which leads to the uh, consciousness paradigm, new ideas on what is the nature of, of being. Uh, 
the the new idea you know the uh, the the engineering paradigm or the or the, or the machine paradigm says the brain is just a meat computer a computer made out of meat it's a mechanistic model the 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 uh, old paradigm says sentience is just an illusion free will is just an illusion everything is in newton's laws the future is predetermined uh you you have no free will you're just you're just a piece of meat that's uh, computing away, and you have all these illusions. For, uh, and that's very much in contrast to the more advanced consciousness paradigms where, where, where they're doing experiments to uh, show that they're real. And, and basically, the conclusions coming from these uh, consciousness paradigms is that mind actually alters reality. We have healing. We have psychic, psi type of phenomena. We, our minds can bias the wave function collapse. And then there's ideas like the group mind creates the reality we, we're all participating in a group mind that we're not conscious of maybe if we meditate and get into this altered state we start to become conscious enough but we actually create a consensus reality and what's interesting is there's actual experiments showing that these ideas are, are uh, might be true in fact i had a couple stories i guess i could tell one uh uh garrett modell uh at the Breakthrough Energy Conference, I had a chance to talk with him privately about some of his, he's repeating Dean John's experiments, uh, psychic experiments, and there's one very simplistic one that, that I really liked that, that he described, it, where the, you, you just put on the headphones and there's a noise source and you can bias it to, to make the clicks either go in the left ear or go in the right ear, and then he found out most people can, can, can make this bias occur from this noise source. And what they do, they can also uh, record the noise source on, 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 on tape or, or somewhere and, and uh, just to prove that, yeah, when nobody's trying to bias, the, the equipment's completely unbiased. It's just random if nobody's in there trying to bias it. Well, if they take that recording and, and store it in the safe and nobody has ever viewed it or listened to it, or, or, uh, then somebody later could, could try to alter that and make it uh, go to the left or to the right. In other words, they, 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 they find out that if nobody uh, recorded it or measured it, that the person could still bias what's on that, what's on that tape. So he's not really influencing the tape. What he's influencing is there's all these parallel universes selecting from a parallel universe and since the measurement hasn't been made he can start to bias it one way or the other so they could actually play the device back the person thinks he's he's biasing some noise source in real time but what he's actually doing is uh, biasing this thing that hasn't been measured yet but yet it was pre-recorded so this this is a, an excellent Excellent experiment that shows there's something really, really bizarre happening, and it has to do with consciousness. So not only do we have a free will in this model to, to help select a, from the probabilistic futures and bias things to go in that direction, but if the past, even though it's been recorded, has not been viewed by our consciousness, it's free to be selected as if it's a, it's if the choice is still in some quantum mechanical parallel universe and can be selected later. So we can either collapse, bias the wave function uh, in the future or bias the wave function in the past. So these are very exciting no notions. And uh, I highly recommend Lynn McTaggart, it's an investigative reporter. She uh, basically interviewed some of the leaders in the field. And this is a great reference to, see, to really go see the experiments. She, she's meticulous about reporting it. Uh, the half of the, the book is references to go into the literature to find the actual experiments, showing that, my gosh, our minds are something incredible. And we're outside the engineering paradigm, the golden age paradigm. We're on to some new consciousness quantum selection type paradigm and this was a uh, book the uh, paradigm wars that shows the, uh, the how the paradigm wars are, f are being fought out today he wrote this back in the 90s but he sure predicted ahead of what's going on uh, today so this is of interest to to us uh, people uh, we're looking for a new energy source can, can the zero point energy become an energy source well to get a zero point energy uh, coherence we uh, 
we have to have the system self-organized. We have the zero-point energy plus the theories of system self-organization. And a good example is pair production. Out of the vacuum pops an electron positron pair. Well, that, those pairs are huge compared to individual vacuum fluctuations. So that's an incredible self-organization. And then we can get conglomerates, typically in plasmas, the charge clusters or ball lightning. And we'll see the cavitation bubbles may have something similar going on or just vortex of plasma all can be coheres of the zero-point energy. And so basically, the, the energetic vacuum uh, is arises essentially from the uncertainty principle, and they realize, gee, the, uh, the vacuum itself is a seizing, churning, uh, fluctuating entity that can make self-organize in these pairs of electrons and positrons. And notice that if we're allowed to have a violation, this is a violation of conservation of energy. If you, if you treat the vacuum fluctuations as non-existent, then you can't explain this. They have to have them there as real uh, to make uh, quantum mechanics work. And there's plenty of support in the literature that the vacuum zero-point energy can be the basis of the quantum effects, the stability of the hydrogen atom where the interaction with the vacuum energy keeps the, keeps the electron from collapsing into the nucleus. It's that interaction that makes this new state uh, that makes the atom. Uh, it can become an energy source without violating thermodynamics. That's a very important paper politically. You can prove that, no, for, you're not violating physics if you say you're tapping it. It can be the source of gravity, and it can be the source of inertia, and which means if you can control inertia, you can make gravitational propulsion, and that's where you can get your flying saucer propulsion idea. So that paper gives you your flying car if you want to fly fast. All right. And so there, the zero-point energy basically can be modeled as a turbulent virtual plasma. They call it the quantum foam. Uh, those, these little particles could be thought of as a, down at the Planck length, 10 to the minus 33rd centimeters. And electric flux enters and immediately leaves uh, through an adjacent hole. So this, this, this turbulence, this chaos, is what the underlying form is. And when you ask, can it self-organization be triggered in this? At first, the answer seems to be no. Everything decays to random. is chaotic. Random things must forever remain random. Uh, that's the, that's the way uh, science works. Well, under certain conditions, self-organization may actually occur. And that uh, Nobel Prize was given to Ilya Prigogine for, for this discovery and this insight. And those conditions are uh, the system must be nonlinear, be driven far from equilibrium, and have an energy flux through it or a matter flux through it. And it turns out the zero-point energy can fulfill those conditions if this zero-point energy flux is from the higher dimensional space. And so this is our flat land slot across the middle. You know, as, as this orthogonal flux comes through, this produces the quantum foam. It enters and immediately leaves. So, so there is a tilt to it. We'll see, uh, we'll see a slight bias in the plane, and we call that the polarized vacuum. If there's vorticity c coming through, it's like a vortex as it comes through, then we say, gee, that's an elementary particle. So an elementary particle is basically a vortex or a vortex ring of this flux, this flow coming in from a higher dimensional and then eventually leaving, trapping energy into the vortex. Uh, Robert Lachlan is probably he's a, the leader for this paradigm that that things, uh, everything emerges from self-organization of collectives. So the, uh, he is basically the third paradigm as far as what is the nature of, of the elementary particles. It's not a string, it's not a point, but it's a collective, a collective of these vacuum fluctuations participating in self-organization. And I personally am firmly in his camp. The problem is his camp is extremely unpopular because you cannot do simplistic calculations anymore. The, uh, the, the calculation machinery has to start all over again, and, and so this is ignored. So the paradigm war is over saving the calculational machinery of physics. And they love their math, and they love the calculation mach algorithm machinery, and if his paradigm is accepted, we've got to start all over again. And that is what is causing the primary resistance in the scientific community or physics community from accepting this notion. So basically, the, so thus we have to have an experiment. So the principles for cohering the zero-point energy is work with a highly nonlinear system like a plasma, abruptly far, drive it far from equilibrium like an abrupt discharge, and maximize the zero-point energy interaction using ions or, or, and vortex forms. It turns out that the electrons in a circuit, just in copper wire, 
are essentially the electron cloud is in thermodynamic equilibrium with the zero point energy. No, it doesn't really, t it can't really top the energy for no gain. That's why in your typical circuits you're not going to see uh, very many ener energy anomalies. However, if we work with the nucleus, and abruptly move the nucleus, the vacuum polarization in physics literature describes steep lines of vacuum polarization converging, and if you abruptly move it, you can start to, sp uh, to spend some of this energy into our space. And here's what it looks like. The zero-point energy orthogonal flux comes, the abrupt motion of your plasma particles, the nuclei in particular, bend some of that zero-point energy flux in, into our space, and it manifests as extra voltage or extra potential in the system. That's, that's how we get the extra energy uh, from ion motion. Uh, they see it. They call them... Uh, exotic coherent vacuum states in quantum electrodynamics arising from heavy ion collisions. They see it in the experiments working with ions. When they oscillate ions in synchronization, they call it the plasma ion acoustic mode, they see huge energy anomalies manifesting these energy anomalies, and they typically are associated with triggering some self-organizational modes in the plasmas. They have large radiant, radiant energy a spikes, high, fr high frequency, runaway electrons, anomalous heating in the plasma, and the nature of the self-organized mode is a vortex ring. Uh, the it uh, gets us into the plas uh, ball lightning plasmoids. It's, a vortex ring is like a slinky closed on itself. Here's the nature of the flow, uh, flow in the vortex ring filament, and this is the archetype entity that seems to be cohering the ener zero point energy and trapping it. So we get it from abrupt discharges in plasmas. And so here we have, we have these energetic torus form. It's a recurring archetype for self-organization at all scales. So if we do pair production, electron positron pair production is, is actually a zero point energy coherence. And they started out as, as just popped in as a pair together. And so what they're now modeling is entanglement between these pairs that they are connected by a wormhole. This is the type of, uh, and Suskind is kind of leading the charge because it allows these things to stay connected and then when they fall, when one falls in, into the black hole, the other one's still, still connected. We still have our informational preserved by this entanglement thing and uh, the problem that the crisis is occurring now is, uh-oh, when it falls in, this, this thing may break and that causes uh, energy, another energy discharge to occur at the event horizon of the black hole, which they call the firewall. And the reason this is a crisis is because we're going to lose the information when this occurs, and, and out goes the quantum mechanical machinery. This crisis is, is a paper was published uh, last spring, last year, and uh, it is causing a paradigm crisis in physics right now. The, the, the paradigm um, informational loss at at the, at the event horizon of a black hole, but it's causing the theoretical physics to be in crisis. So this is great. This is an opportunity for us to come along with the experiment. So see, no problem. We have higher dimensional things happening. Well, a good example of this connection through a, through a wormhole, or connection through a filament, is a, is a follow cosoliton. On a, on a, in a swimming pool that's very still, you can make these dual vortices just by uh, stroking a frisbee through, and you can show that this little filament exists by, by uh, like putting a little bit of ink in the, in the pool and it, and it outlines you wanna, it. You want to play that video? Yeah, let's play the video. Here's the video. This is, uh, I think, Kine made this video. He's a topologist. All right, let me see if I, I'm sure I've got that in here. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, Falico Solitar. So he's a topologist at the, um, I think, uh, down at the University of Texas. Great teacher. Uh, he's really an advanced, advanced thinker. He's kind of fun to, to read his website. Let's see here. It's this one here. It's a virtual particle. Right. I hope this is coming through clear. On the yeah, it should. It should. Um, they have uh, this one has sound on it. It's, I think it's kind uh, talking. Yeah. Didn't put his name down here. Now, are you but saying that those two black spots are connected under the water? Yeah. Oh, oh look are at you that! Watching the video. Yeah. That spot well, completely disappeared, disappeared and came back. when mm -hmm. the that actually is the way the lights reflect. Right it's the sunlight uh, okay. reflecting back, but it's still there. 
And there's two black spots. I oh, think it's a shadow. That. That's amazing. Thrown on the bottom of the pool. It itself. looks like gra gravitational lensing effect from these vortices. It was just made from the, just the that other. frisbee stroke. Well, now, as far Into the as the experiment goes, that this appears this will to be, be a keeper. simple. It looks like something awfully easy to do. There's some interesting right, and it's well recognized this, this exists. This, this is not proof of vacuum energy or anything else. It just shows the analogy of imagine the, the, the plane of the pool is flat land, and that little filament connecting those two things. That's the higher dimensional. So what we did in in the model is connect what. A, what appears to be two separate things are still connected in the higher dimension. And that this, uh, basically this follicle soliton illustrates uh, the, uh, a flatland analogy of what is being presented um, with, and what Suskind has uh, really promoted. By the way, that idea has been around a long time. I think Suskind's gotten traction because he's been able to quantitatively uh, start to mathematically model it. And, and people are starting to accept it. The people, I mean, the, the advanced physicists themselves. So he's kind of, uh, he's, he's one of the leaders in the field. Uh, are we done? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, okay. yes. Oh, the, uh, yes, the video was, has been done for a while. Okay. So basically, uh, what we can do is if we continue, we have two connections, one going up and one going down, we just made a higher dimensional entity. And this could be viewed as a torus, a hyper torus. This means that we have a higher dimensional entity that's really the pair, the electron-positron pair that just popped in, in, into existence. It's really connected, but it's a single entity that appears in our space to be two separate things, yet it's a single entity in the higher dimensional space. And a good way to illustrate that is with the hyper torus. And what happens when you rotate in a higher dimension, it looks like when it's, it's turning inside out, when it's projected into three space. Go ahead and play this one. And so as you see it, as you see it rotating, it has this inside out quality to it. But it just means that uh, that's just the projection uh, for us flatlanders to see of what's going on with this higher dimensional thing. And this could be what's, what's going on with the, uh, even the elementary particles themselves. They have this, uh, this rotation uh, associated with them that, that's like a hypertorus because these entities, these particles, are really higher dimensional entities. And we only get to see the flatland cut of them at any moment. Yeah, that video and, did complete. Okay. And so basically, during, if we have this hypertorus plasmoid and it tends to twist this extra energy in, it's called ortho-rotation. We're ortho-rotating the zero-point energy flux, and all of a sudden we can get propulsion on this thing. We can start to get an acceleration occurring, and this is where the anomalies are occurring. And, and we'll see that the, this has actually been, been measured on these plasmoids, this, this anomaly of excess energy, and it takes us to... Uh, providing sufficient energy to make the Alcabir warp drive. You can go, the, this is, gets us in the Star Trek type of ideas where we're warping the fabric of the space time metric itself because we have now have sufficient energy in that zero point energy flux to, to bend the space time metric. And this is what's going to give you your flying car, or your flying saucer. And so basically, we could take a symmetrical high energy matter torus, give it an abrupt discharge, uh, get it into a plasmoid form, and that plasmoid form would start to rotate the zero-point energy flux, uh, offer anomalous propulsion, offer anomalous energy in the way of a high-voltage spike when this thing collapses back down from the plasmoid. And so basically, the plasmoid itself is, gets its energy actively from the zero by pumping that zero point energy and orth rotating it. So during the time we're in the matter mode, even if it's in a high energy state, nothing special is going to happen. We don't got a whole lot of energy, it's just a high energy state. It's when it's in this form, the plasmoid form, that's when the big energy spills into the system. That's when the big anomalies occur. So we're trying to get to those plasmoids, and that's our experiment. If we can make these entities, these plasmoid entities, then we are observing huge, huge energy anomalies, over-the-top anomalies. 
And so here's our experimental evidence. Uh, the water rock explosions by Peter Gano. He's been talking about this for years. He uh, first measured them in MIT back in 1985. And basically, as a chamber, he does a very abrupt electrical discharge. He's able, he actually was able to photograph a plasmoid in, in the discharge chamber. And it was so great, he would actually blow out the bolts on this apparatus. But he measured excess force by throwing the weight up into the air, measuring how high it goes. And, uh, but he didn't measure all the energy because he blew out the bulbs. So Gary Johnson repeated the experiment. He's at the University of Kansas, and he just blew his uh, sphere apart with the abrupt discharge. And he could then throw the weights up into the air, uh, measure how high they got thrown off, and he proved that, indeed, when we have a very abrupt discharge, electrical discharge just from dumping a capacitor, that we have uh, both excess force and excess energy. We have our energy and force uh, violation. This is a paradigm-breaking experiment, and, and the physicists don't want to touch this one with a 10-foot pole, but yet it's one of the simplest experiments to do. Now, it's very important to realize that the, that the capacitive discharge has to be extremely abrupt. If it is not, you just get a normal little discharge in water, nothing happens. Nothing special happens. It has to be, so it's very, very important to make it very abrupt. And that's a, you'll see that's a common theme in this work. And here's a web page that, that says, hey, if this is really happening, can we uh, use that as a fuel source? Try to make, and what you're doing is you're kind of making these big plasmoids from scratch from this abrupt discharge. It's, uh, it's pretty hard, but that, that opens up as a possibility. Uh, these uh, energetic clusters can likewise form in inert gases. And they know uh, inert gases don't react. These are nice experiments because there's no chemical reaction. So there's no heat of combustion and things like that. They kind of are clean experiments. So they, in, the, in the open literature, they say, yeah, the laser excitation causes these clusters to have, uh, have an explosion and then abrupt release of kinetic energy uh, that's not heat. It could be the source of the famous PAP engine. And you'll notice that when we have, we have to condition the, the inert gas to be in clustered form. That's why it takes a lot of conditioning of the, of, the, of the inert gas mixture. But notice that when the piston is closed, it even has a vortex ring-like shape. That shape like, is shaped like a giant vortex ring to cohere it into a giant plasmoid in the, in the PAP engine. And we have uh, replications. These guys have been on your show, both Bob Rohner and Russ Grease. And they, they have their open source projects. It's a, it's a, it's a tough project to work. Uh, plasmas are not easy to work with. Uh, and kudos for them uh, to do it. But basically, it gets to our pulse plasmoid energy engine. You inject these energetic clusters. You give it a abrupt pulse. You make the plasmoids. They have anomalous propulsion. Anomalous, they re repel each other when they're really packed and tight. They create a huge anomalous force. And basically, the force is sourced from the zero-point energy. Uh, microscopic ball lightning is another great experiment. As Lake Ken Shoulders was the source of this. Uh, uh, basically, it's just a point uh, discharge from, from a point, uh, pointed electrode. He has to get a very sharp discharge from a capacitor. He knows exactly the energy on the, on that he had on the capacitor. He launches this little ball lightning entity on, on the micron size. And in his studies, he shows they have excess energy. A beautifully written patent, by the way. Not legalese. He wrote this himself. Ken Childers was truly a Renaissance man. And so basically, he named them electron volitum to mean strong charge e or EVs or exotic vacuum objects later. He changed the name uh, when he was convinced there was excess energy by harvesting the vacuum energy coherently into these forms. They manifest a charge equivalent to about 10 to 11 ele electrons. They have uh, 100,000 ions in them. They always seem to exhibit a, a charge to mass ratio like the electron. So that's an interesting clue. And they do contain excessive energies. Uh, they are in every lightning stroke. Here's a, um, a high-speed lightning photo uh, photography. Go ahead and play this. And you'll see uh, that uh, there's EV precursors to every lightning strike. And uh, they're at these high speeds, they're able to finally capture them when they play it back in slow motion. And so, you know, this is a single lightning stroke. So we're talking of a fraction of a second. That's why you don't pick up all this activity with, with, the, with your, just your eye. Oh, that's it's, interesting. Uh, I always was told the trailer came up from the ground towards the sky, but I saw a distinct trailer coming down from the sky to the ground. 
Yeah. By the way, uh, Jerry Decker put up uh, uh, Ken Shoulder's shadow site after he passed away. It's the source to get to his work, download all his papers and some of these videos that Ken would, would, had up on his site uh, to, to illustrate that it's, that it's really happening everywhere. It happens on every spark, basically. So microscopically, we're tapping the zero-point energy on every little spark. And there's been presentations at the Tesla conference over the years and things like that where some People were just saying, yeah, every spark has excess energy. Are we done? Oh, yeah. Okay, they, they can kind of form in the chains at a certain spacing. It's like they can get into formation of some sort. The positive EV is very important because it, too, exhibits a charge-to-mass ratio like the positrons. They were a rare event. But it proves that these clusters, these EVs, are just not simple collections of elementary particles. It's not a collection of positrons. It's just exhibiting this characteristic uh, as if it were. Therefore, it implies it's not uh, the regular ones that are negative are not necessarily just a collection of electrons. It's like we made this macroscopic charge out of the fabric of the vacuum itself. And uh, they know this because you don't have any of the uh, positron electron annihilations when when the when it hits when it hits matter you'd be flooded with gamma rays if it was made of positrons. So this is a very significant experiment. Uh, it gets pair production of these positive and negative ones, and they kind of spiral around each other. It's just like making pairs uh, in the vacuum, except he's making them at a large scale, at the micron scale. Uh, they can go dormant. And all of a sudden, a small pulse brings them back to life. So if somehow it can stay in this energetic state and stay, stay around. Uh, very important. He calls them the black EVs. And basically, guys, plenty of anomalies associated with them. They can bore holes in ceramics, high melting point ceramics, and they disrupt the electron bonds, not by heat, but by making the bonds between the atoms just let go because we have coherent energy in, in, in these entities and, we're, and it's, it appears to be melting and sloshing, but it's not heat that's doing it. And he's measured what he called propulsion. He was very coy about this because he knew that people would object to this observation, but they exhibit this self-acceleration type of effect uh, that gives us hope that this is maybe the essence of, of, of what is a flying saucer all about, where, where you can surround yourself in this type of plasmoid type field and all of a sudden go along and get, get a free ride. And also evidence, he's measured evidence of element transmutation. And, and you can get radioactivity remediation if you transmute a radioactive material to something more benign. He found they make huge force anomaly. This was the biggest force anomaly. He, uh, Ken Shoulders claims the record. Uh, uh, he says, for a small EV that doesn't take much power, just a little capacitor dump to make the small EV, if he shoots it through a little vo water vortex, he goes th through boreholes, bore approximately 10 microns in width, and this is about one micron, all of a sudden he creates this coherent vortex, uh, and, he, uh, and it makes such a powerful pulse that exceeds uh, the excess, the damage he can do by the pulse exceeds way more than any energy that was input into the system. And he wanted to show this to Peter Grenou and, and other people. He, I remember in 2000, he went on a road trip to contact different researchers. He actually stayed with me for a few days uh, to tell them about this. He did not publish this in, in the open literature. This was the big, and he could not really find a way to tap it. He said anytime it hits something, it would, it would damage it. And it was, he said the analogy is like shooting a, a, a bullet at a windmill blade. You just go right through it. In brainstorming at the Tesla conference, we said, hey, why not try the Tesla turbine? Because you're shooting something in a gap, and it uses the boundary layer effect to make the turbine spin, so you're not shooting a vein on the turbine, and maybe that could be used to tap this, this effect. So that might be an exciting prospect for those folks that like to play around with the Tesla turbine. Uh, study Ken Shoulder's uh, patent and see if you can apply this idea to it. So the point of element transmutation, a different topic, is not so much to make a practical, oh, a de device. It is because element transmutation itself is a paradigm-changing experiment. If that repeats, something new in physics is, is going on. And that's really the point of the, these type of experiments. Ken Shoulders uh, showed that EV strikes will create nucleosynthesis. He gets all these new elements across the periodic table. He was politely ignored. I think he would break, gave the presentation at the cold, 10th Cold Fusion Conference. Uh, and so 
not much happening in the United States uh, because it's a paradigm shifter. Probably, probably the best transmutation experiments in the world today uh, come out of Russia and Ukraine. It's uh, the Proton 21 laboratory where they hit these pure targets. They make pure element targets and they hit them with big plasmoids about a centimeter in size. They, they did these big plasmoid strikes and it blows the heck out of the target and they get nucleosynthesis elements all over the periodic table in, in this thing. And the West completely ignores these experiments. In, in Russia, every year they have a conference on it called Cold Nuclear Transmutation and Ball Lightning, trying to uh, come up with new theories, trying to explain these new experiments. This is completely accepted in Russia. It's changed the paradigm, but it's completely ignored in the West because, after all, we gave out our Nobel Prizes for, for the, the theory of the nucleus, the quark theory of the nucleus in particular, and damn if it's going to change. We're going to say any experiment that shows that uh, that violates our theory cannot exist we will ignore those experiments and here are the best experiments on the planet being repeated and repeated and repeated those professors in Russia are paid salaries to do research projects to try to explain they come up with new theories of the of the nucleus trying to explain this effect because nucleosynthesis is a real real anomaly to have all of a sudden transmutation all across the periodic table not just maybe moving it one one atom over in the periodic table we're all over the place here so we're on to a new new paradigm and the russians have jumped on board and the united states in particular but mainly western science completely ignores it. Because, and we understand why. Because paradigm shifts are too disturbing emotionally. Uh, they will ignore any experiment that, sh that shows it is occurring. And, and that's just where uh, the nature of, of science and the nature of paradigm wars and paradigm shifts. And of course, just, uh, in 2012, Mark Leclerc came out with his announcement that he could do it in water, with water cavitation. And basically, we presented this before, uh, and Mark Leclerc presented at the Global Energy Conference. It's quite a simple setup. He has aluminum veneer he, he, he uh, puts in a chamber. Here is assembled. We have a cavitating pump. We, we create, create a lot of cavitation right here. And then we look. Uh, he has to start the pump and be right on the threshold of priming the pump. So it just go almost out of prime. That's a diff that's kind of a tough place to hit. He's constantly adjusting his valve and he was sitting too close to the apparatus. But when he gets those transmutation, uh, when he gets those cavitation bubbles in here, he gets evidence, hard evidence of uh, transmutation occurring on the surface. Not only does he trip a Geiger counter and, and radiation meters and while the experiment's running, but he's able to accumulate it on his plate and then he analyzes it, right? He sends it out for analysis and sure enough, he has nucleosynthesis. He has stuff all over the periodic table. Uh, rare isotopes that just don't appear in nature. This is his ash. This, this proves he has something remarkable just analyzing that material. And uh, there's actually been some preliminary replications since he made his announcement and, did, and gave his talk at the Global Breakthrough Conference this, this past October. And we have the preliminary re replications of uh, just measurements of, oh, yeah, we're seeing higher radiation detectors, detection above background, sometimes 10x. Uh, he uh, got a, a group out of the university in Austria working, and he prefers to work with them because they know to keep it all shielded, and they're trying to use remote-controlled uh, valving to keep the thing on the cavitation point, which is hard to do. On, on, uh, we have a comment by Dog One uh, in the Revolution Green site, Mark Dancy's site, that was uh, discussing these issues, showing his somewhat success of, of getting higher radiation levels. And he chose to abandon it because he's not equipped to protect, protect himself from the experiment. And I have a very interesting blog uh, that's keeping current by uh, David Zwig, and here's his, his link, where there's all sorts of discussions, and you'll see the conservative scientists chiming in. It can't be, it can't be, it violates the laws of physics. But now we know why. We know why they're saying that. We know what, what paradigm they're stuck on. So it's very important when somebody says it violates the laws of physics to say which paradigm are you on? And understanding that gives you understanding of where that person's at, as, as opposed to having arguments. If you're on a different paradigm from him, at least you can understand where he's coming from. How can cavitation cause nuclear synthesis? As Mark Claire 
theory they measure, sure enough, when uh, the cavitation bubbles near a surface, it f dimples up and forms the reentrant jet, which shoots through the bubble. The high pressures of this reentrant jet, this collapsing bubble, all the energy of that collapse gets concentrated into just the jet itself, the reentrant jet, where extreme pressures are occurring. Now, now we're the, the width is here on the nanometer type of scale. Th those extreme pressures put the water into a solid state form. And at the tip of the solid state is something that Mark called the plasma valve shock. And I recognize it's just like shoulders EVOs. Everything you're describing, the way it carves trenches and everything else, I, I immediately put him in touch with, with uh, Ken's shoulders to say, you've stumbled across an easier way to do it. Uh, that's the same type of phenomenon occurring at the tip of his, of his water crystal. Uh, basically, we have a, a linear axis down the water. Here's Mark LeClaire's diagram of it. Down the, there's a linear axis of, uh, of water, and then uh, we have hydrogen bond building up the crystal um, across it. So this is kind of the form of a solid state crystal. And we have a little bit of preliminary evidence from Chris Ekman's study of Brown's gas to say, gee, we're seeing this little bit of preliminary evidence. There might be this linear form of water involved. Uh, in it, and he realizes that can't be stable unless it's participating in a cluster where, where there's other uh, atoms around it. And it, uh, the stable state is like Rydberg matter, where the electrons are up at this higher energy d orbitals, is what they call it. And you can read about Rydberg matter on, on Wiki. So basically, we have a form that's somewhat quasi-stable where the electrons are actually up at a higher energy level as long as it's participating in some type of cluster form. And the way we can get that cluster form is uh, taking mark observations that sometimes these linear, these water crystals can form into a loop, either connecting the head or tail or in collisions with each other, they can actually become loops. And these loops are now the linear chain, they close on themselves, and they could be stable when they're under a half a micron. And so if we put the d orbital electrons in, and we then have the various hydrogen, the protons, hydrogen ions, uh, kind of attached to it in the cluster, we get the model for a seed of the water cluster itself. And it's a torus form that's in high energy. Uh, and this is, is the uh, form that we are uh, suggesting for the hypothesized water glass cluster that, that occurs in Brown's gas, the this, this secondary gas that I've been talking about in my lectures. And basically, when we take this particle and subject it to a spark, it turns directly into a plasmoid. As the electron collapsed down in a symmetrical fashion, we made the plasmoid. And thus, we have our plasmoid coming from a fog water gas cluster entity. And so basically, the EVOs of charred clusters and the charged water gas clusters exhibit the same anomalies to explain Brown's gas. In particular, it's a cool flame. It's not hot yet. It can sublimate tungsten. It's just like EVs can do that. It's not heat that's doing it. And there's claims of element transmutation. Uh, and here's to matter. It's polarized. We have the same phenomenon. This was the big clue that, uh, that, that, that told me that this Brown's gas has EVs. Somehow we're making EVs in, in, that, in that torch. And we can, we can start to piece together uh, by combining what Mark LeClaire has shared with the discoveries of Ken's shoulders to come up with a model to explain Brown's gas. And I like the Brown's gas electrolyzer type experiments because they are the easiest to do. These are the best experiments for the hobbyists. Uh, George Weissman was onto it. He called it electrically expanded water, and that's the symbol he gave it. Uh, when it implodes, it gives off an electric shock. He says there's some type of liquid crystal uh, structure to it. I credit George Weissman with the discovery because he made the announcement back in 1976. He did the, of this empirical discovery. And when he's getting this type of gas, it looks like fog. And sure enough, uh, you had uh, Ronald Mitchell on your show uh, showing that, hey, I, it doesn't happen very often, but when I do get it, this, uh, I can see fog coming off the electrolyzer, and that's a clue that we're making this secondary gas. We're making basically clouds, cloud type of particles. And uh, in that are these rings, these, these uh, rings 
that, uh, that turn into plasmoids in the torch. So it gave me an idea. Let's just go for it directly. This is, this is my suggested thing to, to play around with. Use a piezoelectric ultrasonic water fogger. Now we got the fog. Whether you use zinc oxide crystals, the nice thing about that is they vibrate. They uh, make a little voltage. Uh, uh, and then they can do, uh, they have enough to produce hydrogen oxygen. I know how much current you have, but you're over, you're over your volt and a half. Uh, but it's just a polarization voltage. But the real suggestion to play around with is combine that, that ultrasonic fo fogger in your electrolyzer with high voltage pulsing, but don't have much current. Use minimal current. Work, ah, you can work with distilled water. Make sure you don't have much pulse. And see if you can make these charge water cluster gas directly. And at first, I wouldn't worry too much about the energy budgets and everything else. Just show you have an unusual gas for the first cut, that you've really got something there. You can vent away your hydrogen and show there is an amazing fog gas here that has the, the anomalous properties of the Brown's gas torch. And, uh, and you vented away your hydrogen, and, and you're seeing something remarkable just by playing around with these two ideas. Uh, so that's my big suggestion for uh, everybody watching this video. Just play with that and make an electrolyzer that's not meant, meant for electrolysis it, into hydrogen, but it's meant to mimic the dynamics of a thundercloud. And you think along those lines, I bet you we'll get to something incredibly fruitful that would actually change the world. So basically, the energetic fog particles uh, convert to EVOs when that ring is sparked. We make the plasmoids directly. So all of a sudden, we inject this energetic fog gas in. The high abrupt high voltage makes the plasmoids. And once again, we have anomalous mutual repulsion when it's packed in, as well as anomalous acceleration and then force. And thus, we uh, are tapping the zero-point energy from these particles, the easiest thing to do. And this opens up the possibility of the self-running genset. So we have such over-the-top force uh, in the piston from this, the, 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 these plasmoid particles that we have way more energy than we ever need to close the loop. We all have excess energy. We have losses all over the place. And despite all of that, we had the anomaly so huge that you could make a self-running gen set. And such a thing would obviously change the world. And th the beauty of this is if we can make that, those fog gas electrolyzers and repeat it, on these open source projects, we punched through the, the repeating experiment. We made the easiest to make uh, zero point energy device for all garage guys to make it. All we need to do is play around with those two ideas to get there. So uh, it's a spectacular paradigm change. So in wrapping up, zero point energy can be, can be a source of energy when self organization occurs, and it occurs when we make these plasmoid forms. Uh, and if we can get a lot of vortex of these plasmoid forms, uh, you can even get a bigger zero-point energy effect uh, by making these plasma vortexes. Uh, the cavitation uh, makes the reentrant jets, which makes the water crystal. When they form into the rings, we get our charged water cluster particle that looks like fog. And then when we take that charged water cluster, hit it with the abrupt discharge, we have our plasmoid form. And when it's put into the engine, we got the huge anomalous force that's essentially sourced from the zero-point energy, which allows the closed-loop genset. Paradigms. Understand what paradigm you're in when, you have, when your belief seems to be violated by somebody's claim. Are you believing in classical physics? Most engineers are there. Uh, relativity, the quantum mechanics, the zero-point energy can come into play. We see that the, the quantum gravity people are in a big paradigm work, the string brain people right now, and they believe in their paradigm. They, to them, that zero-point energy is a reality. They believe there's really a fourth-dimensional space. The people back here think these guys are kooks. The people back here think, oh, those guys are just so ignorant. They're, they're, they're uh, poor flatlanders. If you, if you believe in a fourth-dimensional space, anyone who doesn't, you just pity them. Oh, you're just stuck back here in this paradigm. So I understand where you're coming from. You're just a flatlander, and that's all you can see because this is where your beliefs are at. But I don't have to call names at you and, and say you're wrong, and I can understand why you think I'm a kook because as long as I'm on this further down the path on these paradigms, you're going to be thought of as, the, as, I know you're going to think of me as the kook, and I won't be offended because I understand where you're coming from. So here's my chat room request. When you want to call someone a fraud at any time, state the type of fraud you think they are. 
uh, is it an intentional scam you think they're pulling? It's just a mistake of measurement? Or do you believe there is no, there can never be an energy anomaly because you're firmly entrenched in the, uh, the classical paradigm where only conservation of energy, zero-point energy can never enter, and any, any of that stuff? Then know that. Know that you're objecting because it can't happen. The reason it can't happen, you're invoking the standard proof. It can't happen by, based on the paradigm that you believe. So what I ask is that you understand the paradigm we, that you believe in. Because when you, you can't, here, you, no energetic anomalies could ever occur. Well, let's say we get to an example of a QMOGEN. If there's a plasma tube or something like that involved in that circuit, and if indeed in that tube you have ball lightning-like activity, and when that ball lightning collapses and produces an anomalous pulse that gives you excess energy, you actually made a zero-point energy device, and the, and the, the motor generator part are just, are just, uh, just a way to, to work with it. The real anomaly is occurring in the plasma tube. And so you can start to look for where is the energetic anomaly occurring. If you say it can never occur, you can invoke what I call the standard proof that says nothing new can occur, no energy could ever spill in from anywhere, therefore number three does not exist. And therefore you're just like the, uh, you can be just like a scientist or like a normal academic person that says this can occur, therefore the only, it must be a fraud of either type one or type two. But if you entertain the notion that an energetic anomaly could truly occur in the new physics, we show this energy is very, is very much there, then the possibility opens that you could say maybe the fraud could be due to bad business practices. It's a shame to hang a guy out to dry. He really stumbled across something, but he didn't know what he's doing as a businessman, or he certainly couldn't explain it. Because the explanation takes us into these very advanced paradigms that very few people are aware of and know about. So he's not going to be able to explain it well. But, but, and so understand where he's coming from. And when you object, understand if you're objecting based on the laws of physics, understand where your own personal paradigm regarding those laws are at. In closing, I'd like to say some words about suppression. The number one reason for suppression, and by far, that's occurring is simply your personal belief. I don't believe it because it can occur because it's not in my personal paradigm of my view of the laws of physics. And by far, uh, that is, I'd say, dominates. Dominates throughout the inventing industry, dominates the engineers. So the engineers are not going to try these experiments because they are stuck with, I just don't believe it. Academic is in the same way. It violates the standard paradigm that they believe in, and therefore it's fraud. So they're just either on one type one fraud or type two fraud. It can't exist otherwise. You get into a court of law, the phys steam physics professor saying it's fraud, it can't be done. They hang the poor guy out to dry because he raised money to do it, and he's doing a fraud. And so everything is like a type one fraud to them. Uh, business interest is a little more interesting. They might believe it, right? Yeah, oh, I got a real working experiment. I'm starting to get some traction in my business. Hey, I'm, I'm, let's they behave like the mafia, like Guido. Hey, nothing personal. You threaten my business with your device. And, and uh, when this occurs, congratulations. You're finally whack worthy. They're going to bump you off if you don't back out. And the fourth level of security is, oh, this is the men in black stuff. Are there security issues here? This discovery may be too dangerous for mankind if we really start to tap that for appreciable energy. If you can make a flying saucer, well, you can do other things with it too. It's energy's energy. You can use it for good or, or bad. You can make a whole new series of weapons with it, right? And who wants to go there? So I have to give them a little credit. I'll, I'll, I'll cut them a little slack and say, you know, at least your motives were noble. You just weren't out for grabbing money you were actually trying to protect mankind from himself. So I'll give you some credit there. So what are the solutions to suppression? Personal beliefs? Well, you're entitled to that. Make up your own damn mind. All I ask is that you understand the, the paradigm you believe in when you do so. Academic? Well, all I can do is just poor, pity the poor flatlanders. They're just stuck in that paradigm. I understand where they're coming from. And they're just stuck in that paradigm. So you're not going to get mad at them. You can understand where they're coming from. On business, the way we can uh, deal with that is just the open source projects. Just all the knowledge is distributed, distributed all the projects, and that's where, that's where our, our viewing audience is going to change the world because when they go open source, it's everywhere. The business uh, hitman can't knock off everybody. It's just an information war at that point. 
Security issues, I'd respect that as they're looking out for mankind. And I'm afraid that the solution here involves consciousness transformation. Well, now, the no, I, think, I think most of the business, uh, you know, most of the security issues that uh, uh, they, they protect are the business issues. You know, the, I think the men in black work for General Electric and Westinghouse, but that's neither here nor there. You know, I've, I've made up my own damn mind on that one. Right, and you, uh, you're out a lot of donuts because of it. That's right. <laughs> so this takes us into the consciousness transformation. Uh, there, there, there's evidence, and I'll just jump to the realizations, that what, the, what the consciousness transformation movement's all about. Uh, you can read all, uh, all about it. There's plenty of information on the web and books and in Lynn McTaggart's book, the experiments to show this type of thing. And I'll jump to the conclusions of where this will lead. The first realization is that we are spirit beings having a physical experience. There is no death. Consciousness goes on. Our minds are linked as a group being. We actually are literally each other. And there's help on this transformation top side. Any support in the chat room for this last one? Help top side. What does that mean to you? What do you think, Gary? What's top side mean? Uh, from that next brain up the ladder. <laughs> yeah, it could be. There's entities helping, right? Whether they're spirit and channeling or whether we have UFO contacts. Uh, look at the C. SETI stuff on Stephen Greer's site, right? Lots of people claiming that. It's, it's all over the place on, on the web. There, uh, and that's where the paradigm shift. Uh, we may not even need help. If we start to shift... Right, and get into this consciousness transformation and realize these things, it may be easier for other people to shift as well. Notice the paradigm shift is personal. There is actually when, when you shift from one paradigm to another, you actually feel a f emotional change in yourself. Uh, because paradigms are very entrenched to the nature of reality and when it's you that truly believe. monkey scenario. This just makes it easier for others to shift. But don't be scared about it. And uh, this, this says, gee, this, these other paradigms might really be true. That's all we're asking. They might be true. As opposed to saying, nope, it can't be. I'm stuck in the, the, the golden age. I'm stuck in the standard engineering classical paradigms. So none of this other stuff could be true. But if all you have to do is say, no, these paradigms are out there. They could possibly be true. That could be another point of view. That's all you really need to be open-minded to say maybe. That's, that's all we ask. If you can get into maybe as opposed to absolutely not, number one, you will understand the other person. And you understand where they're coming from. And you'll be able to uh, 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 empathize with them. You don't have to argue with them or call them names, right? You're not threatened anymore. You say, yeah, they're coming from that paradigm. I, I believe in this one, but I... I'm not objecting any, anymore to, to all these other things. So basically, when you shift your paradigm, you change the world. Literally, you're changing, that group mind is changing. So basically, shift happens. Enjoy the ride. Thank you. How we do on time? Uh, we ran a little bit long, but not too bad. Let me see here. If you, if you, were, um, if you need a stopwatch on it, the presentation ran... Uh, Let's see, one hour and uh, one hour and fifteen minutes. Not counting our setup time, huh? Not Just counting all the setup time. time. Yep. Counting the setup time. Not counting the setup time. Okay, good. And basically, there's my books. Uh, you can get them from Adventure Unlimited Press. And here's the the T. Henry Moray book. His lad, the inventor's last name matched my first name out here in Utah in the 1920s. And we've got a, these slides are available for download. I don't know if Sterling put it up on on this site right here, but that's where I been accumulating all my PowerPoint presentations. I imagine Sterling will eventually get it up there. And you have the link on, uh, up already. Yeah, on, as a matter of fact, um, I, I posted the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation uh, to the smartscarecrow.com site, and it is downloadable from the blog entry for, for this program. So if you find the blog entry for January 23rd, 2014, uh, you will find an embedded copy of the YouTube video that I'm recording, as well as uh, a link to Maury's uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation. Okay. All right. To the audience, looks like uh, looks like we managed to keep a few. We went a little bit long, and I'm afraid we uh, 
we chased a few along a uh, few out uh, with with the length of the program, but that happens sometimes. Uh, we do have 36 active in the chat room. Looks like uh, we got a grand total of about 90 watching, but apparently only 36 of them are interested in chatting. To the chat room, we had a, a fairly involved presentation from Maury. Anybody out there uh, got any questions they want to toss at him? Let's see here. Uh, somebody out here named Avacron is asking if uh, if you've ever talked shop with a fellow named Edward Lewis. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm certainly I'm trying to get into a personal conversation with him uh, and gift him my books. He was on a couple weeks ago. Okay. For you, and and ironically enough, he was also trying to talk about paradigm shifts, right? The, the paradigm of the plasmoid or of the ball lightning. And uh, essentially, we're on the same page because that's that's what I'm saying. It's going to tap the vacuum energy for you. All righty, let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, somebody here talking Star Trek. I'm not sure what that's all about, but that's okay. He wants a warp drive. Oh, he's looking for a warp drive. Well, yeah, I, I wouldn't mind having one of them myself. You know, I'd like to go visit those darn anal probing gray space aliens and kick a couple of alien butts. Uh, uh, I don't uh, think they're. Uh, you got it mixed up. The TSA's D. A anal probing ones because they're looking for a bomb up your butt. Uh, with the with the Gray's one is your your genetic material. Oh, they're okay. cloning to stay alive. I tell you, I can't keep my aliens. I can't keep them track of them all. Let's see. Uh, tell Maury to be on the lookout for another strange, wonderful email from me on a few points. Okay, this is DC Tray Bill. DC Tray Bill is telling you to be on the lookout for another strange, wonderful email from him. Looking forward uh, to it. Let's see here. Maury, have you seen this patent uh, high-voltage input? Oh, my goodness. Uh, Maury, I'll tell you what. I'll go ahead. And I, don't, I don't expect you to be able to answer this you know, on the spot like this. I'll go ahead and post this into the Skype. Um, uh, love to be able to address your, your question, uh, Anonymous uh, 6761, but... You'd have to go looking it up, and uh, you know it's uh, it's it's a difficult one to handle on the fly. Uh, has Maury seen the DVD put out by Maury's son? Uh, no, that's John Maury put out a, a DVD. Well, I don't think I don't Shuba's, think that's Shuba it. seems to think so. T H oh, Maury. T H Maury says. Uh, well, T T H oh, is the father, and John's the son. And uh, I'm, I'll be looking forward to that one. All right, let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see any be... any good questions for Maury now? You know, we're we've run a little bit long, but there's enough of you out there that are awake that I was kind of hoping we'd have uh, a couple of good questions for Maury. I don't know, Maury. They may be they may be falling asleep. HV Gen looks interesting. I'm not sure what. The, okay. Uh, HV is high voltage generator. More detailed parts list. Uh, somebody's asking for a more detailed uh, parts list. I, I I don't think anybody's built it yet, so I don't think there is a parts list. I think it's a it's it's an experimental apparatus that Maury is suggesting, and I think a lot of it, you know, is. Kind of up to your best guess. Play around until you find something that works. I, th I think Zero uh, mentioned once that he uh, knew of a link where somebody was playing with an ultrasonic transducer and an electrolyzer kind of along the lines, I suggest. And, and, and he was somewhat in, intrigued. There might be something there. And that, that's my suggestion of the type of thing to play with. High voltage pulsing, distilled water, and elect uh, transducer, ultrasonic transducer. Here's somebody recommending something on the Pirates Bay. Uh, Q, Q Mori Gen. Huh? Okay, if you say so. <laughs> uh, it's, I'm it's, famous it's, for it's, off topic questions. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's see. How high of a voltage pulse? How high of a high voltage? For, for generating uh, like an EV? Yeah. Uh, kilovolts. It's in the kilovolts with uh, very little charge of the capacitor. Ken was able to get down to, uh, you know, nano, nanowatts type 
levels per per pulse just to launch a little one. And he was using like a uh, something the size of a syringe as his uh, as an electrode. He wasn't using you know we're not talking a very about a very dense uh, discharge here. You know we're we're trying to concentrate it into a very small space. Is the, uh, is yeah, the and idea. I think in the electrolyzers we I think uh, kilovolt type pulses. Remember no current. You know, we're trying to mimic, uh, you know, lightning polarization type events to excite that fog. We're generating a fog and we're trying to have uh, polarization events to make those particles. You know, I've, um, I've seen what I thought was um, uh, steam coming out of an electrolyzer uh, that turned out not to be steam. It turned out to be something else. And at the time, I was too naive to really understand what I was seeing. All I, know, all I knew is that it was very energetic. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, that's, a, that's a favorable, encouraging you know, thing. It, it, but, you know, it's, it's one of those things. It, I, I, I came about it accidentally, thought I had done something wrong, and did work to try to eliminate it rather than trying to explain what it was and, and really investigate it. I thought I was doing something stupid. And, uh, you know, so, you know, it may just be that some of these fellas uh, who are, you know, I, I look at it and I say, oh, he's just hitting his electrolyzer way too hard and he's boiling off the water and making steam, which is what I thought I was doing. But it seemed that that steam was energetic. That's the effect you're looking for. Now, exactly, exactly what conditions, exactly what voltage, uh, you know, I, I can tell you how... I got there, but I'm not sure you would be able to repeat it using um, using the apparatus you have laying around. I was using a, a, a 36 plate electrolyzer. It was a plate style electrolyzer, and I hit it with 96 volts, and I was pumping water through the electrolyzer. Moray seems to think that I might have created some cavitation in the electrolysis device that contributed to the effect. Uh, the gas was indeed this steam that appeared to be steam, was heavier than air, and appeared to be energetic. Uh, I also came across a phenomena where I had um, water in my bubbler that was saturated with what I could best describe as nanobubbles. There were bubbles in the water that remained suspended in the water, and would not come out. I mean, uh, we're talking about, you know, a bubbler that turned cloudy uh, with little microscopic bubbles in there. And even after letting that water sit undisturbed for 10, 15 minutes, I'd come back and it was still cloudy. It still had bubbles in suspension. It took an hour or more for those bubbles to finally settle down to where I could see through the water again. So, you know, some of these effects, you know, when I experienced these things, my initial reaction was, holy cow, I've really screwed up here. I've done something wrong. And uh, I, I worked hard to try to eliminate those effects. It may have been that I was premature, that I should have looked more carefully at it. Don't know. Let me, com let me comment. What if you took that bubble that bubble? I tried water. to ignite the, the bubble-saturated water, and it wouldn't ignite. Uh, if you sprayed it. Put it out uh, as well, a actually, mist. what I did is I, I just I, I got a spoonful of it, and I had cloudy water in a spoon, and mm -hmm. I flicked my bick on it. So okay, let's see if this stuff will burn. <laughs> and or it hit did. it with a high voltage pulse. Now, yeah, now see, spray, I wasn't I wasn't sharp spray, enough yeah. to think about the high voltage pulse. If I'd have thought about the high voltage pulse, I might have been onto something. Bottom line is, you know, there are. Interesting things to look at. Anybody who thinks we know it all and, and, you know, guess again, there are some interesting things yet to be discovered. Uh, let me see here. I might have missed a good question here while, while I was yakking on all that. Uh, Let's just repost it. Yeah. Uh, uh, guys, uh, you know, while I was off on that rant, I may have missed a couple of really good questions for Maury. Uh, got about another five minutes here. Uh, about another five minutes. So if you if you do have a uh, a really good question for Maury that I missed, please post it back up there so we can uh, we can try and get it addressed. 
George Wiseman wrote, Reason a Brown's gas flame is cool is twofold. First, that hydrogen flame radiates very little heat. And second, that a big flame is an electrical flame, not a BTU flame. Uh, he, uh, he wants a comment on that. He's saying that the flame is electrical in nature. Um, mm, I would take exception to George on that one. Uh, th there is an electrical constituent to it, uh, but in my own experiments, what I found is that the gas was conducting voltage from my electrolyzer to the tip of the torch. Uh, Brown's gas is electrically conductive, and I was running an electrolysis device at uh, about 120 volts in some experiments, 240 volts in others, and I could quite literally read 240 volts at the tip of my torch. So in I the, uh, go ahead. I, I, I could comment. Uh, the uh, one interesting observation is take take this fog gas and, and um, get it separated from the torch, and then have an implosion event. And then there's a shock that comes off of it, like very much like a big electrostatic shock. This is something George has observed. And now I think that's where he's coming from when he talks about electrically expanded water. Where I, I believe his, his model of electrically expanded water, my suggestion of, of these clusters, uh, are effectively we're groping at the same model. We're, 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 I, I think we're trying to say the same thing. We just don't have the details proven yet, exactly what it is. That's why I really like Chris Ekman's initiative, because yeah. they were, he was trying to study it in the chem lab. Got, got somebody wants you to look at your uh, crystal ball, uh, wants your opinion on the possible downfall of mankind due to technology. Uh, I'm not sure I'd want to touch that one with your pole. Well, or... I can touch it. I, uh, in fact, that's, that's the battle. Uh, the solution is the, the, the consciousness transformation paradigm where we're not going to take our new discoveries and just make a big club and whack each other. It doesn't look good right now, as you know uh, from your rants, right? You never, you're never hurting for material on misbehavior of humanity whatsoever. You know, I don't even and look so, at the news. I don't even look at the news until about an hour and a half before I'm going to do my show. And there is always a wealth of material to choose from. <laughs> Absolutely. And so uh, I, I agree. Uh, uh, Sterling touches on this too, that, that really we need to mature up before we can handle uh, virtually infinite energy. Well, we, we uh, in, our current in our current consciousness uh, of separation and everything else and the fear of death and all the stuff that goes on with it that makes us march off the war, it's actually not going to work uh, if we just hand it uh, just more matches. It's like giving matches to a baby. So I really think in order to really receive these technologies or, or to gift ourselves with the technologies, it will be hand in hand with the consciousness transformation type of uh, events that will allow mankind to safely use it. In fact, that's a, that's a good note for my final wrap-up. I would say, and, and on, that, uh, on that note, uh, I will give you full screen, sir, and let you have your parting comments. Yeah, so basically, for the chat room, when you want to call someone a fraud, say the type of fraud that you think they are. Understand the paradigm that you're in. So when you say it disobeys the laws of physics, you know which of the paradigms are those laws. And that'll create mutual understanding to where everybody's coming from and, and allow us to uh, be open-minded to each other's ideas because we're not busy defending ourselves or feeling threatened. When you hear an idea from, that's coming from a different paradigm, you'll simply understand where they're coming from and, and not be threatened. I think that'll create a... A, a, a wonderful dialogue where the participants that watch this show will build the energy machine that changes the world because it has to come from outside of academia. So All congratulations, right. inventors. Well, Maury King, uh, as always, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to have you as a guest. It was quite a, you know, some of the presentation was over my head. I'm, you know, once I get this thing uploaded to YouTube, I'm going to have to play it back and see if maybe I can catch up on some of it. <laughs> doesn't take much, at, doesn't take much to be over my head. Well, look at the links. I had to go fast. And well, yeah. Look at we, the links. Yeah. And that, they'll, that, they'll take.